when we work with Newton's second law, we're relating the forces on an object to its acceleration. From its acceleration, we can figure out its velocity and position with time. It's a very powerful technique. In order to do this, we need to know more about how to model forces in physics. Now I'd like to talk about the force of friction. The force of friction is the other surface force that we look at. The normal force was perpendicular to the interface between two surfaces. The force of friction is parallel to the interface. Friction is a commonplace force. It's fairly complicated in reality. We have a simple model to look at it, fortunately. It's an approximate model, but this will work very well in most of our situations. As I said, friction acts parallel to a surface. The force of friction is the small f that we're looking at. It's going to oppose any applied sliding force. So here, if we've got the force of capital F pushing to the right, the force of friction would oppose that and push to the left. Here I'm showing the normal force of an object pressing down on the surface. That normal force is going to be necessarily present whenever friction is present. In fact, that's what causes friction. Our simple model of friction is this, that the magnitude of the force of friction times the normal force. I've got this as an approximate squiggle because what this formula tells us is the magnitude of the force of friction. It does not tell us the direction of the force of friction, so it's not truly a scalar multiplication of a vector. Friction and, and the normal force are different. In fact, they're 90 degrees to each other, as we see in the diagram. This character, mu, is the coefficient of friction between the two surfaces. It basically tells how sticky the surfaces are together. The larger the mu, the larger the force of friction. The value of mu depends only on what the surface materials are and their conditions, such as if they're wet or dry, what their temperature is. It doesn't depend on the mass of an object. It doesn't depend on the weight. It doesn't depend on the contact area between the objects. And it doesn't depend on how fast they're sliding past each other. Static friction is the force of friction that's present when the two surfaces are in contact and they're not moving relative to each other. In other words, they're moving together or they're both still. In that case, we can say that the force of friction is less than or equal to this static coefficient of friction times the normal force. What this is telling us is our formula for static friction gives a maximum value. It can be any magnitude up to that value. The other type of friction is kinetic friction. This is when the surfaces are moving past each other, they're sliding past each other. In that case, we can say the force of friction is modeled by mu sub k, k meaning kinetic friction. And in this case, we can say that the magnitude of the frictional force is just the coefficient times the normal force. The force of static friction between two surfaces is larger than the force of kinetic friction between the same two surfaces. So when two surfaces are sliding past each other, the magnitude of the force of friction between them is less than it would be if they're stopped and in contact. Let's look at some situations that will help us appreciate this fact that kinetic friction is less than static friction. Some common scenarios where we see that that's happening. One example that probably we can all relate to is when you start pushing an object, it takes more force, more of a push, to get something started than to maintain it moving once it's going. But that's because that static force is what you have to overcome to get it moving in the first place. Once the surfaces are already sliding past each other, it's already moving. That's just kinetic friction, which is smaller in magnitude than the static force to get it started. Another example is anti-lock brakes. What kind of friction keeps a tire on the road? What force maintains this traction? Is that kinetic friction or is it static friction? You might think at first that it's kinetic friction because a car is traveling down a road. Actually, it's static friction because the tire is not sliding across the road. It's rolling, but the part that's in contact with the road is not moving sideways relative to the road. It just goes down, sits on the road for a while, and then gets picked back up again. That's actually static friction. So there's more traction between a tire and the road when the tire is rolling than when it's skidding. When it's skidding, the tire is actually sliding across the road. That's kinetic friction. So you have stronger stopping, a larger force of friction when the tire is not skidding. The idea of an anti-lock brake is to keep the tire in contact with the road without slipping, to give that maximal or close to maximal friction. Another example that's familiar if you're learning to drive or if you're dealing with someone who's learning to drive, when an experienced driver brings a car to a stop, they know to feather the brake somewhat just as the car is about to stop. If you don't, if you maintain a constant force pushing on the brake pedal, when you come to a stop, you're slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, and then right at the stop there's a very sudden, very strong force backwards, and you get this kind of a kick. 
That's from changing the friction in the brakes from being the kinetic friction of the brakes sliding past the brake shoes to the static friction when they lock and finally match each other. So you have to release off that pressure so that that force of friction doesn't change rapidly and cause that big jump when you stop. And a last example of the difference between kinetic and static friction is stick slip motion, which is a very common type of motion between two objects that are in contact. They're sliding past each other. Often what happens is if the objects are somewhat flexible, and they'll alternate between static and kinetic friction. As the objects are sliding past each other, they grip for a while, then they'll distort somewhat as they're sliding past each other with this shearing force. Once that shearing force gets great enough to overcome the static friction, the objects will slide past each other rather quickly with kinetic friction, and then they'll stop again for static friction. So it's a rather jerky, jumpy kind of motion, start, stop, start, stop, or as we say, stick, slip. This characterizes motion on a variety of scales, from the annoying fingernails on a blackboard to the somewhat less annoying bowed string instruments such as violins and cellos. It's on a very large scale, the motion of the different sides of an earthquake fault against each other. All these are characterized by stick-slip motion. In the case of an earthquake fault, for instance, the earthquake is the slip phase, and the time building up the stress that precedes an earthquake is the stick phase. Here's an example of a problem to help us understand how friction works on different objects. Here we're going to look at with a situation where we have a 20-ton truck and a 1.5-ton car traveling on the same road. We say they've got the same speed along the same stretch of road, and they're going, if they're going to lock their brakes at the same time, which one stops first? So we have to understand something about the force of kinetic friction. If they lock their brakes, then they're going to be skidding. So the first thing to do is to understand the normal force. Once we know the normal force, we can figure out the frictional force. Once we've got the frictional force, we can figure out what their accelerations are going to be. So what is the normal force? In this case, say we've got a truck or a car going down the road. The truck or the car has the force of gravity pushing down on it. The normal force from the road is pushing up to keep the truck or the car from going into the road. It's what maintains its acceleration in the perpendicular direction at zero. So once we find the weight of the car or the truck, we know the normal force. So the weight's down, normal force is up. So for a stretch of level road, the normal force is just equal to the weight of the object, mass times the gravitational field. For the car, that's going to be its mass, little m, times the gravitational field. For the truck, subscript t, for the truck, subscript t, that's going to be its mass times the gravitational field. Next, so what's the force of friction? The force of friction is mu times the normal force. So how can we compare the mu of the car and the truck? Well, here I kind of snuck in to the problem that the tires are made of the same rubber for the, both the car and the truck. Since it's the same material, we have the same conditions, it's the same stretch of road. So their mu's are going to be the same. The force of friction on the car is going to be mu times its normal force. The force of friction on the truck is going to be mu times its normal force. Now we get to find out what the acceleration is. In the vertical directions, we know that there's no net force. The normal force and the force of gravity cancel each other out. So we're concerned about the component of force in the horizontal direction. The only force we've mentioned in the horizontal direction is friction, so we can figure out the acceleration by the force of friction and Newton's second law. The acceleration is the net force divided by the mass. So what's the net force on each object? So the acceleration of the car is just its force of friction, mu mg, divided by its mass. M's cancel out there. For the truck, we have the same thing, mu capital mg, divided by its mass. And here we see that the accelerations of the car and the truck are exactly the same. The take-home lesson for this is that it's a really bad idea to tailgate a truck.